Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Dr. Shibladi Smith. Everyone knows me as Laddie. And I'm a consultant psychiatrist and I work at the South London and Morsley NHS Foundation Trust. And I also have a role as the presidential, one of two presidential leads for race and equality at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So um, I'd really like to welcome you all to today's event. And this is a celebration of psychiatry. And for those of you who aren't yet psychiatrists, who are thinking about becoming psychiatrists, this is just to give you a little bit of a taster as to what you'll be missing if you decide to go and do a different specialty. Throughout this session, we want you to tweet, say your thoughts. We hope that you're gonna participate in the Q&A. We're gonna have three talks. Uh, three talks, including a video, actually, because we're pretty high tech here, and hopefully. Uh, and what we'd like you to do at the end of those talks is to, if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A function and we'll answer them as, as, as best we can as we go along. So we'll have about, hopefully, about half an hour or so for, for questions. So without further ado, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about me. And as mentioned, I'm a... Um, a general adult psychiatrist, I'm trained as general adult psychiatrist actually, but in fact I now work in forensic psychiatry, having moved over after about, um, actually I think after 10 years of being a consultant in general adult psychiatry. But I um, am somebody who um, essentially, uh, uh, I, I worked in a particular bit of inner, inner city London, which kind of, uh, you know, I, I was consultant for, uh, the Brixton area, and uh, that kind of qualifies you, essentially, for um, doing a lot of forensic work because there's a very high rate of deprivation and peak trauma. And you'll see from the talk I'm going to give you that trauma is really important in terms of people developing forensic issues. So um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit. I, I was I was asked, you know, to to tell people about what it's like to be a psychiatrist, in particular a forensic psychiatrist in my case. And I thought, mm, well, I can try and explain it all to you, but probably the best thing for me to do is simply to give you uh, an illustration with one of the patients that I've looked after. So I'm going to tell you about um, uh, this young man, at the, young at the time, Mr. A. And I want you to think about, whilst, we're, whilst I'm talking, what's going on with him. Then I'll tell you a little bit about what becoming a forensic psychiatrist involves, but I hope you'll understand it very well from the talk. So this is a man who was well known to services with a history of schizoaffective disorder, cannabis misuse, a little bit of irritability and hostility. Um, you know, when he came in, he would be manic, uh, but nothing like what we'd seen before. So it's a real shock. Despite what the Daily Mail tell you, and this is really important, violence towards other people, in, you know, people who are, have severe mental illnesses are rarely violent towards other people. And in fact, only about 5% of all violent incidents are actually committed by people with severe mental illness. And in fact, the main risk they pose is to themselves. So the question is, what was going on with this man? Because, you know, he'd had 10 years of having this condition and now he'd, done, he'd committed these really awful, horrendous offences. I said before, violence, severe violence towards others is pretty rare. So there must be something else going on. It couldn't simply be that this man had, you know, his, his, he was manic again, or because he's used cannabis. He's been doing that for years and this kind of thing had never happened before. So we'd start to think about his personality. Now the thing about personality functioning is that it's shaped by, primarily by your environmental influences. There's a little bit of genetics going on with it but essentially um you, you know your personality is your temperament you know what you're like anyway that's probably driven by some inherent things and then there's what happens around you that can really shape how you function as a person when you look at antisocial personality disorder, and i'd urge you to go and look it up i haven't got time to talk through what it is today but you know we know that antisocial personality disorder has got to be preceded by conduct disorder this man certainly had conduct problems as mentioned uh, there are you know, genetic uh, environmental influences. And we know he had a really traumatic background and there was certainly some maltreatment as he was growing up. And in fact, we also know that particularly for antisocial personality disorder, there's some evidence of a genetic predisposition in that if you have low levels of genes that code for monoamine oxidase or catecholamine uh, 
uh, classical methyl transferase, which are genes that code for uh, certain proteins. Uh, these are the ones that are interesting here, uh, are linked to um, serotonin and, and which of course is related to mood. There's an increased risk of developing psychopathy if a child is maltreated. That's, there's a public health message in there, which is that if you treat your children well, doesn't matter if they've got genetic precision, which is a relatively small aspect of this. If you treat your children well, they're not likely to become antisocial or psychopathic. So what did we do? We formally assessed, assessed his personality functioning, which hadn't been done before. And lo and behold, what did we find? He had sadistic and depressive personality traits. The sadistic traits probably accounts for what happened with his girlfriend and what happened with some of the women as he's walking around. Uh, he certainly um, ticked all the boxes for antisocial personality disorder. And when we did a psychopathy check on him to see if he was actually a psychopath, he scored, this is a, re, this is a high score. So most people, even if you're really mean and selfish, you're going to score about uh, maybe 10 or 13 out of 40 on this scale. So that's someone who you know who's really mean and selfish. And, you know, uh, if you score over 25 in the UK, you're a, that essentially means that you're a psychopath. That's a cutoff. And he scored above the cutoff. So just to say that lots and lots of people have, might have antisocial personality disorder, but doesn't make them psychopaths. Psychopath, if you're a psychopath, however, you definitely score, you tick all the boxes for being antisocial. So what was going on with this man? Well, we know he's got schizoaffective disorder and harmful use of cannabis, but what we also realised is that actually he's pretty psychopathic and sadistic and depressive. So in order to help him and to, in order to help him and reduce the risk of him posing a risk to others in the future, we needed to not only treat his schizoaffective disorder, but we also had to focus on his personality structure and very importantly, his past history of trauma. Okay, so that's what we do. That's what forensic psychiatrists do. We assess and treat people with mental illness associated with antisocial and criminal behavior. And we try and estimate and manage, very importantly, manage the risks that people might pose to themselves or others. We try to understand the causes and improve the treatment and the management of those causes. And we work in lots of different settings in hospitals, uh, high, medium, secure, high, medium and low secure hospitals. We work in prisons, we work in the community and we do a lot of court work and expert witness work and legal work, obviously. Uh, we go to, you go to medical school, you become a doctor, you do your foundation years, and then you specialize in general psychiatry. So we're all generally trained anyway. Some of us much more generally trained than others, as mentioned. And then we specialize in forensic psychiatry and then we become, you become a consultant forensic psychiatrist. And what qualities make you a good forensic psychiatrist? Well, uh, being curious, you have to be interested to know about this individual and what happened in their life before. I would hope that for all psychiatrists, but it's particularly important in forensic psychiatry, you've got to be asking yourself, why has this happened? Why is this person the way they are? Why do they do what they do? You have to be courageous. You have to be fearless, not simply because you might be meeting people who've done pretty horrific things, but actually you have to have the courage to advocate on the behalf of people who are frankly seen, like the Daily Mail, as being the psychic killers of this world. Because I can tell you now that 90 to 95% of my patients have actually had really awful trauma in their lives. And that has driven them to be the people that they are. And that leads on to compassion. You've got to be compassionate for people. If you don't have the compassion, you don't care to help them. And it does help to be clever to try and work out what's going on. Anyway, thank you. So now, uh, if you've got questions about that, put them in the question and answer and we can talk about those later. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, hopefully. Um, yeah, hopefully that's stopped now. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is um, Julia, and that's uh, Julia Ogumuyiwa, and I probably said that badly, is a specialist registrar. She works at the South London and Morsey NHS Foundation, just where I work as well. And she works in the National Psychosis Unit. And she's a specialist registrar in general adult psychiatry. She's actually the diversity lead for the higher tra trainees for our group. But more importantly, she's a founder of the non-profit mental health organization, Colourful Minds. 
and that does outreach the local community to deliver mental health promotion and psychoeducation, with the hope being to reduce stigma around mental health and mental health services for minority ethnic communities. She also sits on the Research and Development Committee for the Mental Health Foundation. Over to Julia. Hello, um, I'll just share my screen to start with. Okay, we're up and running. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm really privileged to be able to give this talk today. Um, so yes, so my name is Julia. I am an ST6 in my higher training, which means I'm in the final year of training before becoming a consultant. Um, my journey into psychiatry has been a little unusual in that I already knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist before I came into medical school. Um, at the time, I didn't really know what a psychiatrist was. Um, and I probably thought I, I would be living something out of an episode of Frasier, which it turns out isn't the case. Um, but yeah, it's proved to be exciting and interesting nonetheless. So I would like to spend the next 10 minutes just talking to you about what to expect if you choose a career in psychiatry. Um, I'd like to also talk to you about mental health in the black and minority ethnic community. Um, I'm very mindful of using the term BAME, and that's because I find this term increasingly more unhelpful. Um, it groups together essentially everyone that isn't white and, well, white English actually, and each culture has unique and different experiences and challenges. So I will be saying black and minority ethnic. Um, I also want to explore the barriers to engagement that people from these communities in particular might face and reflect on the impact of stigma surrounding mental health and mental illness. And I'll just want to end by telling you a little bit about my organisation, Colourful Minds. So I selected this image because it represents quite a lot of what I thought psychiatry would be and also a lot of what it isn't. Um, I did my first psychiatry job in 2011. That was my first job as an F1. And since then, I can testify that I have seen no chaise lounges anywhere. Um, a little bit gutted, but I'm holding out hope that one day I might see one at work. Um, but yeah, so what, what is being a psychiatrist and what can you expect? I would say um, you can expect to be challenged to reflect on who you are. You can expect to learn a lot about how you relate to people. Um, and that has been a bonus that I didn't expect. It, it forces you to think about the person you are and how you interact with others in a way that other medical specialties probably doesn't. You can expect to meet interesting and fascinating people and hear their stories and people share with you some of the most intimate and personal details about their lives which is quite a position of privilege and it has it comes with a lot of responsibility the other thing is it can be emotionally challenging but also really emotionally very rewarding and I'd just finally say that since I've started psychiatry no two days have ever been the same and at this point, I really couldn't imagine doing anything else. So just moving on to mental health in the black community. So I work for a trust that serves a largely black population um, and mental health experiences reflect different, unique cultural and socioeconomic contexts. I am a second generation Nigerian and I was born and raised quite locally to the trust I work for um, on a council estate in quite a deprived area. And increasingly, I'm very grateful for this because my perspective is quite unique as a clinician because many of my peers don't have this background and 
can't relate to this background whilst many of my patients do and I feel able to relate to them in ways that perhaps others can't. I feel able to educate my peers to have a better understanding of the communities they serve and most importantly I feel able to advocate for the needs of this community. Um, so the reason I'm particularly interested in this community is because they are overrepresented in mental health services. They're more likely to be diagnosed with a severe mental illness and more likely to have admissions to hospital under section, so detained against their will to be in hospital. They are more likely statistically to experience poor outcomes as a result of interacting with mental health services and they're more likely to disengage from services and encounter mental health services via the criminal justice system. So this has got me thinking about the barriers to engagement, because why is it that this group that is overrepresented within mental health services do not feel able to engage with them um, as, as well as their white counterparts? And it made me wonder, are the services designed to help them and are the services helping them to thrive? And I'm not sure that they are. Um, and it makes me think, how can we do better? So some of the barriers to engagement that I've listed, I suppose the first one is the individual's ability to recognise their suffering from a mental health problem. It might be that they don't feel able to accept that they are, or it might be that they're not aware that they are. I think stigma is a really big barrier to engagement, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. I've seen firsthand as a clinician working in this area um, just how harmful it can be and the consequences for people not able to access the help that they need because of stigma. Fear, um, I think particularly within black and minority ethnic communities, there's a lot of fear around mental health services and around institutions in general. Um, and I've been reflecting on power imbalance People can feel very powerless when they're coming into hospital. Institutions like um, mental health hospitals have enormous power over people's liberties and the ability to restrict them in ways that I guess you and I take for granted. Mental health services, I think, have underrepresentation of black, particularly leadership at senior levels and this can lead to cultural naivety and insensitivity from service providers which means that perhaps we're not always meeting the needs of this population and as I said lack of diversity at high levels um, can be an issue and I think this needs to change and it feels like the tide is turning and things are starting to change. So what is stigma? So it can be described as a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality or person. And I've been reflecting on just how harmful this can be to people. I've seen myself that people will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid being labelled as unwell or mentally ill because stigma the stigma of having that diagnosis shrouds people and their families with shame and, and people are afraid. So what can we do to reduce stigma or stop it altogether? I'll leave you all to reflect on that and I'd be very happy to hear from you what things you think we could do. But I think one of the keys to reducing stigma is to educate people. So I founded an organisation called Colourful Minds um, and as Dr Laddie has already explained, we're a non-profit mental health organisation and we are mostly made up of mental health professionals but we have other professionals that um, are from different backgrounds that work with us. Um, currently all our team are from minority ethnic backgrounds and this was intentional because I think people need to see themselves represented in the clinicians that are working with them and in the services that make decisions about their lives. 
I think people feel better able to relate to people that look like them, understand the food they eat, the music they listen to, what their religious beliefs are. So we do our work by doing workshops in local schools, churches, mosques, um, other community organisations, and this creates an opportunity for us to have an open dialogue with the wider and the local community around mental health and mental illness. So not only are we educating people, we're able to hear what their thoughts are, what their needs are, and feed that back into services so that services can be adapted to better suit their needs. And we hope that this sort of bridges the, the disconnection between mental health services and the people that have high need. And this, this, this can lead to missed opportunities in treatment for people that need treatment. And um, so here are just some pictures of some of our events. These are actually quite outdated now because um, we've, we've had been fortunate enough to do many more events since then. And one of our um, exciting partnerships is with the Mental Health Foundation, which is a well-established UK-wide charity that have been around since 75 years. Black Thrive, which is a Lambeth based charity and Youth Guidance, which is an American organisation. And the project is called Becoming a Man. This project is being trialled for the first time outside of the United States. And it was originally designed to reduce serious youth violence. And it's had actually pretty impressive results um, evidenced by um, one randomised control trial. And there's an ongoing qualitative study. Um, it's essentially a CBT informed mentoring program that aims to build mental resilience in people that are at risk of becoming perpetrators or victims of serious youth violence. So we're very excited to be involved in this project and we are rolling out the program in three Lambeth schools that is actually starting now. So in summary, Black and minority ethnic people need to be represented amongst mental health professionals at senior levels. Stigma within these communities can be harmful and can make people feel isolated and prevent them from accessing the help they need. We can fight stigma by educating ourselves, other people and being compassionate and we can also serve an important role in advocating for the needs of people who are suffering with mental health difficulties and um, so I'll just leave you with our social media handles please follow us please reach out to us if this is interesting to you and you'd like to join us and work with us if you feel passionately about mental health and you feel passionately about reducing stigma please we need you come and join us and thank you um, I'd like to hand back to Dr Laddie Okay, hello. Thank you, Julia. That is fantastic, actually. So Julia's given us a really excellent overview of what the current issues are and um, the kind of things that you can do to make a difference. And I hope people recognise that this is, this is a, you know, what's going on right now. We've got a big sea change. And our, our, my hope is that you'll all get involved in some way or other. And um, please, 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 after, just to say that if you do want to find out more and you don't find out everything today, which you probably won't do because we've got so much to talk about, um, do get in touch with us either directly with um, Julia, with, you know, using the Colourful Minds Instagram, Facebook, uh, 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 Twitter account, etc. Or you can contact me um, via the college or via Twitter. So without further ado, our next speaker is Olaladi Obadare. And um, actually she's gonna, this is where the tech stuff comes in big time actually. So um, she is a fourth year medical student um, at the University of Nottingham. And she founded and she leads the African Caribbean Medical Network. She's in her, and uh, she started found out about two years ago. She's very passionate about speaking about, about the institutional, inequality that healthcare students, especially medical students, might experience. As you can imagine, um, being someone who started, I, I think, when did I go to medical school? It was quite a long time ago now. I qualified in 1991. So I understand something of what she's speaking about. Anyway, um, so we're really, really pleased to have her speak with us today. And I think she's got a video to present. Over to you. you.
Hi everyone, my name is Olalade Abadare, otherwise known as Lola, and today I'm going to be talking to you about what I title, What the Future Holds, a Perspective from a Fourth Year Medical Student. So firstly, a little bit about myself. So I am a fourth year medical student here at the University of Nottingham. I would consider myself a keen speaker on topics such as racial injustice and global health. Currently, I am interested in psychiatry and ops and gynae. And lastly, as well, I am the founder of the African Caribbean Medical Network here at the University of Nottingham. I would like to touch on what seems to have been the consensus among, amongst medical students, particularly those in the clinical years here at the University of Nottingham. So prior to national lockdown, we had just about completed the two week induction of the start of our clinical phase. And from there, we went into a six month break from practical and clinical exposure. Having come back, we have been thrusted into the penultimate year of medical school, which is our fourth year, essentially having the clinical skills of a second year medical student. And as you can imagine, that is quite scary and daunting. And this brought about feelings, feelings of inadequacy and also feeling nowhere near prepared to qualify as doctors within the next two years. And also, feelings of uncertainty about what is going to happen next. So navigating medical school amidst COVID-19. So having come back, we have had to adapt to our clinical placements post lockdown, and it's been an experience so far. So firstly, we had a two week observership to round off the previous academic year, which was our third year. And we've had to adjust and adapt along with everyone else to the new health and safety practices and guidelines. However, the shortage of staff has meant our learning opportunities are very much in our hands and not scheduled as we would have found it to be previously. So we are very much having to find find people who would take us through skills etc but we have had incredible support from medical professionals across different levels from doctors to nurses to hcas and that has made us realize that we are not alone in this or well, i speak for myself when i say it's made me realize that i'm not alone in this everyone is going through the same feelings of um of insecurity of struggling to adapt to the new change, etc. So what the future holds? Um, short answer is that nobody is certain. Nobody knows what is going to happen three weeks from now, let alone a year from now or two years from now when I graduate and qualify to become a doctor. But what I will say is that there's no doubt that the impact of COVID-19 will have will be far-reaching and it will affect us um, well into foundation training and I have turned us the COVID generation of doctors to come. I believe that we will continue to develop new ways to support each other and adapt our learning as we work towards getting back to a new normality. I've also put that we need to prioritize our individual well-being it's all well and good taking care of the patients as they come first, yes, but we also need to be prioritizing our mental health, our physical health, and making sure that we are in a good position, the best position that we can be to be able to then take care of others. And if there's one thing that I do know is that we will graduate, us being the medical students, we will graduate, we will qualify, and we will develop to become fine clinicians. So I'm just going to touch on um, my interest in psychiatry. So it started with a sign up to a psychiatric mentoring scheme called PsychStar at the University of Nottingham back in 2017. There, there I was paired with my mentor who I still keep in touch with. And the scheme was my first gateway into the world of psychiatry and it provided an opportunity for my questions to be answered. Following that, I have recently completed my psychiatry attachment where I have had a great and inspirational experience. It has opened 
my eye to the complexities of the specialty and has shown me how caring psychiatrists can be, not just from a strict medical standpoint, but concerning other areas of a patient's life. Currently, I am particularly interested in perinatal psychiatry as I feel like it combines my love for obzangaini and my love for psychiatry. And lastly, I just want to say to any other medical students here or any other medical students who are watching this conference that times are tough, but we are going to get through it. Um, we shouldn't underestimate the power of community within medical students make sure that you gain support from your peers and to also have the confidence in your abilities that you will make a fine doctor despite unprecedented circumstances and that is it thank you so much for listening i should be joining for the questions and please feel free to ask any questions thank you very much bye Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lola. Um, oh, my video is gone off again. Thank you very much indeed to Lola. So um, I'd just like to uh, say thank you to both of our speakers. Now we have an opportunity for some questions and there are some questions in the chat. I think I'm, just, I'm gonna pick them out because I know we're not gonna have time to do all of them, but I think that our helpers have been trying to uh, you know, um, answer some of the questions that have been going along. Now, there's a question here from Rebecca Cooper. And what she'd like to know is what do the speakers, what are the speakers views about how to encourage more black doctors into psychiatry? So, um, Julia, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I try to do that on a individual level and I would love to see more black doctors in psychiatry because frankly, I don't see enough. And just seeing the, the relief on patients' faces when they come in and I'm their doctor is so rewarding. I can't even I can't even describe it. Um, and given that I've said black people are so overrepresented in mental health services, there's definitely a need. So, you know, I can only just share with people my personal experiences and encourage them to pursue a career in psychiatry if they're interested. Um, but I think doing more events like this um, for people seeing more black doctors and um, not just black doctors, black psychiatrists, knowing that we exist, I think that will go some way towards encouraging others and um, people mentoring other people. Because I think when I was in medical school, I really struggled to find black doctors, period, to to be my men mentor. And I and I felt. I, I found that quite difficult. Um, so it's nice to see medical students and reach out to them and connect with them and be able to support them to, to navigate their way through their chosen specialty. So I think, yeah, seeing seeing that we exist is, is a good start. Yes, that's right, actually. I think someone said to me the other day that um, if you don't see it, then it's unlikely that you think that you can be it. And that's a really, that's a really important point. And certainly it was quite difficult for me, as you can imagine, many, many years ago and definitely not seeing anybody of colour, really, uh, you know, certainly not like me in, uh, you know, medical school. We weren't taught by anybody and there were hardly any doctors there. I'm very pleased, however, that there are increasing numbers of um, black people going into medicine. I would really like to see many more people going into psychiatry, however. Lola, what about you? Uh, you know what? It's funny. You said some, you said about really enjoying psychiatry in Obstagani. So did I. Very interesting. I was absolutely fascinated. I thought, which one am I going to go into? And you know what? The thing about Obstagani is it's great if you get to deliver babies and that's lovely. But if you're the obstetrician then you, and you're called in, then it's because something's gone wrong. And that's really sad. Where it, and psychiatry, you know, there are sad things that happen, but it's never, ever, ever boring, always interesting. So I'm really hoping that you're going to go for psychiatry. Lala, any thoughts about um, that question, how to motivate more black people into psychiatry, not just medicine, but psychiatry? Um, firstly, I thought part, um, part of Judith's presentation, where she was talking about the stigma surrounding mental health, especially within um, African Caribbeans. And I think 
after speaking to other African Caribbean medical students, there is evidence that that's part of that stigma still is still present, not just within normal civilians and just people like normal um the patients, but also the medical students themselves. And a lot of that is is ingrained by our respective cultures. And I think one of the main things that will probably entice more African Caribbeans into the field of psychiatry is the experience in itself. Having exposure to what the specialty has to offer, the beauty of the specialty, seeing um, a lot of Black people within um, wards, psychiatric wards, and how it affects, how mental health affects people that fall within the African Caribbean demographic is more likely to persuade and of someone who is African Caribbean to possibly follow their interest or, or pursue their interest in psychiatry. Because what, I can only speak for myself again, um, but what I found is that seeing a lot of African Caribbean men, especially in mental health wards and um, be, them being treated within the community for things like schizophrenia. And then when you hear the statistics and the evidence that says that um, schizophrenia, like African Caribbean men are four times more likely to be prone to um, health conditions such as schizophrenia, it, 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 I, I feel like it strikes a nerve within me but it, just because I'm, I'm African Caribbean myself and that passion just it increases knowing that okay that these mental health conditions affect people who look like me and it affects people who are within my vicinity and people who I call uncles and people who I call like people that I see as father figures etc and if it can affect people like that and if any like I said if anything it just increases the passion within me to want to pursue psychiatry um to treat people who look like me and to also destigmatize um mental health conditions within yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Ola, your uh, um, signal is a little bit funny. It was a bit funny at the beginning and at the end, but we think we've got the most of what you're saying. In fact, you touched on a question in the in the in the uh, Q and A, which is um, that uh, someone's asked an anonymous person, someone who's anonymous, has said, "I've I've always heard that patients, as well as psychiatrists, face stigma. Have you also faced like a, a stigma being a psychiatrist?" And you actually touched on that actually at the beginning of what you said. And um, I don't know if Julia has anything to say about that actually about the stigma that um, you might have faced as a psychiatrist. Actually, yeah, I I have, <laughs> I very much have. I think. You're quite right, Lola, when you say that within um, African and Caribbean culture, there is quite a lot of stigma. And even within my own family, I still have my mum asking me, are you sure you want to be a psychiatrist? <laughs> yeah. like, well, pretty far gone now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think people have this fear that psychiatry is a really dangerous specialty and the patients are dangerous. Um, and I try to dispel that wherever I can. Um, but amongst other clinicians, actually, that aren't psychiatrists, I think you'd be surprised the stigma within, even when I go and see patients in A&E, I definitely get this sense that the A&E doctors often just want to get rid of the psychiatry patients. Um, and I find that quite upsetting. And it makes me think, what can we do to educate even other specialties around psychiatry the more people know and understand what we really do and how it really works I think the better and the, the less the stigma will be but I, I've certainly faced stigma and um, being a psychiatrist there's also you know people come with lots of preconceived notions about you and a common one is um, you're analyzing me or you know what I'm thinking and Firstly, I'd like to say, I don't like to work in my free time. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. And also it's actually very effortful to, um, to, to think about someone in, in that context. So I, I don't feel as though when I'm with my friends and family that I'm doing those things. I think there's, like I've said, it, it has changed me as a person. I've learned so much about myself. And I wouldn't change that for the world. It's I think it's been so valuable in my own personal development as a human, not just as a clinician. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of lost my thread there, but um, essentially I have faced stigma as a psychiatrist, 
but I do what I can to try and work against that and reduce that stigma by talking to people and educating them and that seems to help. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. So I'm going to, um, there are some points that have been made. Uh, Akeem Sule has said, it's really important to decolonize psychiatry curriculum. I'm really happy to say that that is being worked on as we speak. So there are going to be some things that will change. Uh, there's a question about, uh, there are a couple of questions about doctors who are trained overseas, actually. And there's a very important question about um, the cultural and language barriers and whether that will make a difference in psychiatry. So I wonder if, um, uh, Julia, Lola, maybe Lola, you want to say something a little bit about, you know, um, whether you know any uh, um, doctors, um, so medical students who've come from overseas or, you know, doctors from overseas who, you know, maybe um, black African doctors or uh, doctors, African Caribbean doctors um, who have come from overseas who may be having problems. Um, I think we probably see more South Asian doctors more than any, but is there anyone that you've come across that you think it might have made a difference to? Yes, actually. Um, so, just in my recent um, second section, there was a Nigerian doctor um, who was um, a GP trainee, but he was um, doing a psych rotation. He was on the um, um, psych ward at the same time that I was. And it was really refreshing to see um, a Nigerian on the ward as well, because I feel like it's uncommon for uh, an African um, Caribbean medical student to be in a to be in a ward where not only was he the, he wasn't the only Nigerian there, there was someone else who was also Nigerian. And it was a breath of fresh air because um, a, my name was being pronounced properly. B, it, it just felt very comforting. Um, but in regards to training um, in another country and how that translates over here, um, from what he from what he um, told me and his experience so far, he talked about having to do um, sort of like a conversion examination because he trained in Nigeria and he also worked in Nigeria for um, a good few a, a good few years before um, coming to the UK and practicing here. Um, he said it was quite difficult, the exams are quite difficult, cost a lot of money and you have to speak to the right people, especially people who have been in the or walked the same path as you have. Uh, but seeing as Nigeria is an English speaking country, um, there wasn't much of a language barrier, so to speak. So I can't really touch on that as well as um, someone else might be able to. Okay, so I do think there is definitely, uh, without a doubt, there are there are cultural differences that can impact on how how easy or not it is for people to pass their exams. So uh, certainly we see that we know that um, overseas doctors don't do so well in their exams and are actually much more likely to be referred to the GMC. So there's def there are definitely issues, and again, that's something that I think the Royal College Psychiatrists are trying to work on. Thank you, Lola. Um, I'm just gonna. Uh, just a couple of things people have said what's the worst thing about being a psychiatrist and I wonder if it's the same person who's also said uh you know what are the stress levels like I would say the worst thing about being a psychiatrist is being chronically under-resourced actually that is the biggest problem uh, mental health services have been under-resourced for years and years and years which links to Julia's points about stigma uh basically there's a lot of stigma it's not just um stigma in um um black and other ethnic minority populations it's stigma in just generally in society that's changed a lot over the years and that's made a difference but but it has helped it has helped over, the time to change stuff has helped and what's happened more recently has helped but nonetheless despite the fact that one in four people have a mental health problem that means that's 25 percent we get less than i think it's less than 11 percent of the health budget something like that and it's particularly important, someone's asked a question about child, children's mental health, child and young people's mental health. And the question is, you know, if we attended to things when people were adolescents and, and when they were young, would that make a difference later on? The answer is absolutely yes. There's very good evidence that if you can, that you can treat a, 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 a child or adolescent with a mental health problem, then you can cure it. If, however, that problem doesn't get treated until they're an adult, it will just essentially escalate and get worse and it will it's much more likely to become a relapsing um, remitting condition or a more um, pervasive permanent condition that interferes with them achieving their potential so all of you out there please advocate for better resources for 
um, psychiatry. Okay, so uh, other questions. Um, so there are some specific questions about my talk and psychopathy and things like that. And I and what we'll try and do is to answer those questions separately if we've, if we've got time at the end. But I think some more uh, questions about um, some more general questions. Um, so there's a question for probably for Lola, but I think also for Julia. Have you got any tips? about how to make the most of psychiatry placements when you're in medical school. So the medical school that Gillian's at, who's asked the question, Gillian McNaughton, Gillian McNaughton has got a lot of psych psychi psychiatry placements, but she wants to make sure she learns as much as she can rather than just being a passive participant. So what is the best way to, and then a quick, a, a, a quick um, statement from Lola, then Julia, and also I might have a couple of things to say about that too. Lola. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. I was just I was just typing an answer to that actually. Okay. Um, what I would say is just be bold enough to or try and go outside of your comfort zone to ask all manners of uh, medical professionals if you can or if they have anything interesting in their um, schedule that you will be able to tag along with. Um, I'd say don't just stick to shadowing your junior doctors or your consultants, but make sure you ask your CPNs, um, your occupational therapists, um, crisis team, etc., to see if they've got anything that they could bring you along to, because you're more likely to have more hands-on experience and also a lot more experience regarding how um, how um, mental health conditions are managed in an acute way. They tell you. Um, they make they allow you to do more things like for example take a history or conduct a risk assessment etc and they'll tell you what patients are more or more appropriate to do that um with and which patients are not so i think definitely just ask around and sooner or later someone will take you on to like a visit or they'll ask you to do a task for them so yeah okay julia any thoughts yes so I think this is true for any clinical attachment, but particularly for psychiatry. Spend time with patients. Spend as much time as you can talking to as many different patients as possible. And I think you'll find more than often, the patients want to talk to people. They want to tell people their stories. Um, and you can learn so much by just spending time with them and just having a chat. It will also help you learn the best ways to get information from people and practice your history taking skills. And the final thing is ask questions. Don't be afraid to sound ignorant. Ask questions if you don't understand something, if you don't know something, if acronyms are being used that you're not familiar with, if terms are being used that you're not familiar with, ask questions um, and never be afraid to do that um, in any specialty. But my main tip is just spending time on the wards talking to people. Yeah, and I have to second that actually, if you are on the wards a lot, I know it's a bit more difficult at the moment because of COVID and there's lots of remote working, etc. But if you are around, then people will see you as part of the team. And certainly, um, you know, when I was doing medicine, that's how it works. We were part of the team. If you're only there, um, you know, when you have your tutorial, then people won't see you as part of the team. But if you are there and you say, and sometimes people, I say to people, look, why don't you um, take these two patients and they're your, on your caseload and follow them through for the time that you're here. And then you've got something to say and you've got something to feed back into for the ward round. And you, the patients always tell the medical students stuff that they don't tell anybody else. And it's really, really important. It becomes, a, I mean, that's what, that's what I did. That's what the really good medical students do. They become part of the team. Okay, so uh, there's a question here about um, adverse childhood experiences, uh, ACEs. Uh, lots of doctors, well, lots of psychiatrists are aware of adverse childhood experiences and the impacts on later development of psychopathology, that's um, mental health problems. Can't say that I know that that's true for all doctors, but we know increasingly that many doctors are recognising the, the issues with this. Uh, someone has asked about um, uh, what work's being done to support black and ethnic minority trainees, psychiatric trainees to, uh, with exams and GMC matters. The college is currently working on, on strategies to try and improve outcomes. It's going to take a while for it to um, seep in, but I'm hoping that in five years time, what we'll find is that the massive disparities are actually significantly reduced. 
There's a question about why black people are more likely to be sectioned. Why do we all think this is? That, I have to tell you, that is a whole other three hour seminar, I'm afraid. But in the meantime, please go and have a look at the supporting documents from the Mental Health Act Review, and that might help you to understand some of the issues around that. And you can easily look that up. Um, and then some questions for, uh, back to questions for um, Lola and, and Julia. So Julia mentioned about um, the, the uh, higher, um, black people in particular, actually, not being seen at more senior levels of organisations. And Tarek has asked, he actually asked me, but you know, I'm going to ask you, Julia, and uh, uh, how do we encourage um, black and minority ethnic staff um, uh, and managers and doctors but to, essentially to take up higher, higher um, positions in the NHS because we are actually 20% of the workforce? I think, again, it goes back to if you can see it, then you can see yourself being it. So, you know, it's been hugely inspirational to me to see people like yourself, Laddie, at senior <laughs> leadership roles. Um, and it's made me feel as though potentially that's something I could do one day. I think we need trust to be proactive about this. I don't think it should be a kind of passive process that we wait to maybe happen. I think trust should be um, proactively seeking out um, people of colour to represent the populations that they serve at, at senior levels. Um, particularly at South London and Worsley, we serve mainly black people. And it's since I've been working there since 2013, I think it was, um, I, I haven't seen very many black um, people at senior levels and I want to see more. I want to see the white leadership be accountable for um, encouraging this to happen and seeking it out and requ requ making sure it's a requirement. I don't, I don't think it's good enough that it's just this is how it is and that's how it stays. I think that there needs to be more from the top insisting that we we have people at these positions and we create positions for these people because there's there's so much that they can contribute in terms of understanding the population of the local communities that perhaps their white counterparts may not be in a position to do. Excellent, thank you. I have to say, I agree with you, but what's missing, and this is really important for anyone out there listening who might have it be in a position of influence, you have to train and train people into those positions. It's not enough to say, you're pretty, you seem pretty good, you could do this, because actually that's setting people up to fail. You actually have to learn how to uh, do committee work and work on committees and understand what it needs. So people need, there's a, men, there's a question here on something about mentoring. And actually what people need are the same things that everyone else needs. And that includes mentoring. Sometimes it's formal courses in how do you do management stuff and um, management speak. But actually people have to be trained into that position. And oftentimes when people fail, it's because they're not actually given the same training that everybody else gets actually. And that's often quite informal training to get into that senior leadership position. So last question is for Lola actually. Lola. How much did the Psych Stars scheme motivate you to think about psychiatry? Do you know about it? The Psych Stars scheme? Yeah, do you know about this or, yes. at all? Yes, yes. So I was one of the, so psych, I think the Psych Stars scheme originally started in the at the University of Nottingham. And I was one of the mentees in the first, um, the first cycle. So it's, inspired me a lot. The Psych Start Scheme, I think, is a brilliant, brilliant scheme. Um, it's done a lot in terms of um, exposing um, medical students who are interested in psychiatry, exposing them to what it's like, giving them mentors who would talk them through what it's like, talk them, um, give them necessary experience that they may need beyond psychiatry as well, be it just medical skills, be it resources, etc. So I think it's a really, really good platform. If there are any medical students out there who are thinking of um, joining Psych Start, please do that. I fully endorse it. Um, it was especially good for me because of the mentor that I was paired with um, and she 
whatever it is that I needed, um, if it is, was experience in um, psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, I remember, and it was terminated psychiatry as well, that was able to get like a couple of days of experience. And that really, really fed my interest in psychiatry. And it, 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 it just allowed me to become more curious about the field, um, which was, which is exactly why I'm still interested in psychiatry today. Um, so yeah, Psych Star was very, very, very um, instrumental. <laughs> and, yeah, my interest. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to have to finish. Now there's a question here about psychiatrists not earning as much as doctors from other specialities. I don't know where that idea comes from. It's just not true. We are all paid the same, certainly in the NHS. And, and if you decide that you want to go and do private work, then you can go and do private work and you can charge as much as, if not more than people who are in other specialties. Um, especially because, as you know, there's a, you know, because of under-resourcing of NHS services, those people with money need help and they still go to psychiatrists. There's a very, there's a thriving industry, actually, in private work for mental health. And then the other thing is, as for example, um, as a NHS psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrists often have to do medico-legal work, and in fact, general psychiatrists do as well, and you can charge for those reports. So do psychiatrists earn as much as the doctors? Yes, and frankly, some psychiatrists are really filthy rich. So if that's what motivates you, I really hope it isn't just that. But if you are bothered about the money, don't worry, you'll earn as much money as everybody else. Okay, we are going to have to finish. I need to say to um, you know, both speakers, thank you so much. You are, I'm sure everyone will agree, this is so inspiring, actually. Um, Julia, who's about to become a consultant soon, it's so, it's very lovely for me to be able, I'm going to be able to see more and more colleagues who look like me, which is great. And to Lola, Lola, look, babies are cute, have your own babies, but please be a psychiatrist, that's what we need. <laughs> And for all of you out there, um, I really hope, for those of you who are thinking about psychiatry, do get in touch. If someone's asked about mentoring. I'm sure the colleagues can help put you in touch with somebody. And for those of you who are thinking, I'm a nurse, can I go into psychiatry? Yes, you can. You can do four years, a four year graduate course, and then you do the same thing as everybody else. Remember, whilst you're training, you're earning. So you will, you know, don't worry too much about the money. Please, please, please come and do it. The more black people in mental health, the better it will be, the better the outcomes will be for everybody else. Thank you to our organisers, that's Isabel and Claire, and thank you to Leah for helping as well. And I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.